In the second webinar session, I'd like to talk about convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, since they made quite some impact in the last decade. The main ingredient of convolutional neural networks are, of course, convolutions. But before we can talk about how to convolve an image with a filter, I'd like to talk about multilayer perceptrons, or MLPs. We start again with the functional mapping, y equals f of x. In the previous session, you have already seen how to establish a linear map by multiplying a vector x with the matrix A. Here we want to call all the entries in the vector x input neurons, and all the numbers in the output vector y output neurons. In our case here, we chose the dimensions 3 and 4. The matrix A establishes an all-to-all -all correspondence between the input neurons and the output neurons. Of course, you are always free to add a bias vector B of the same dimension as the output vector Y. The whole functional mapping Y equals A times X plus B is called a linear layer in PyTorch, and it has three arguments, the number of input neurons, the number of output neurons, and a Boolean flag that tells us whether we want to use a bias vector or not. Other deep learning frameworks might call it fully connected or densely connected layer due to the fact that the matrix A establishes an all-to-all -all relationship between the input and output neurons. Now you might ask, what happens if I stack many linear layers? And let's just have a look at it. First of all, we multiply the input X with the matrix A0 and then add the bias vector B0. After that, we take the output of the first linear layer and pass it to a second one. Then we compute A1 times the output plus B1. Subsequently, we can expand the expression and gain the result A1 times A0 times X plus A1 times B0 plus B1. The first expression is just the product of two matrices, which again is a matrix, and the remaining part of the expression is again a vector, and therefore all we did was just creating a new affine mapping A2 times X plus B2. Therefore stacking linear layers does not serve any purpose. Unless you destroy this precious affine structure by applying a nonlinearity to all the output neurons. Historically, scientists have used S-shaped functions such as sigmoid, tanh, or the inverse of tangents. More recent research uses rectified linear units, which simply forward the positive contributions in the output vector y and set the negative ones to zero. There are modifications of ReLU, like Leakey ReLU, which also assign a contribution for the negative half space, or exponential approximations of Leakey ReLU, like ELU. Finally, we apply the nonlinearity sigma to the affine mapping A times X plus B. And suddenly we can stack linear layers when interleaving them with nonlinearities. On the right side, you see an autoencoder which approximates the identity map, but we also want to here reduce the dimension to the most important ones. We can do that by using a cascade of linear layers which incrementally decrease the dimension until we reach the middle where we have the latent code of only two dimensions. Then again, we increase the dimension until we reach the output. On the left side, you see the implementation. In the constructor, we just here create the linear objects, four of them, and also the nonlinear activation ReLU. In the forward pass, here we just interleave the linear maps with a nonlinearity until we reach the right side of the topology and return x. The good news is that you don't have to implement the backward pass because PyTorch does that already for you. Let's talk about datasets used in the visual domain. You might have heard of ImageNet, which is a collection of 15 million labeled high-resolution images with 22,000 categories. But whenever you read ImageNet in the press, they usually talk about the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Competition dataset, which is only a subset of ImageNet containing roughly 
1,000 images in each of 1,000 classes, and if you multiply those two numbers, then you will gain roughly a million training images. We also have 50,000 validation images and 150,000 testing images. This dataset was used to benchmark machine learning algorithms in the past and today. On the x-axis, you see the timeline, and on the y-axis, you see the top five relative classification error of the machine learning solution trying to classify the images in that dataset. Before 2012, you see a relative error between 30 and 25%. Those solutions mainly used lovingly handcrafted feature representations and then passed them to traditional machine learning algorithms such as random forests or support vector machines. But then suddenly in 2012, you see a big improvement by almost 10%, where AlexNet just introduced a convolutional neural network implemented on the GPU. Then we see steady improvement over the years. Popular entries are GoogleNet, ResNet, and so on. Humans usually perform in the zone between 5 and 10%. And as a result, we can say that modern solutions might even outperform humans on average on this task, of course. As discussed on the previous slide, convolutions as a basic building block were very successful, but you might wonder why. Convolutions are a specific subset of linear maps, namely translated scalar products. Here we have the input vector x as an input, a 2D image, and it is multiplied with a filter or kernel A of size 3 by 3. Moving the kernel matrix to the upper left alignment position in the input image x, we have to compute the pointwise products 5 times 1, 1 times 3, 6 times 2, and so on. If we sum over all those contributions, we get the final result 40. Now we repeat the same procedure for the alignment position 1 next to it, and we get the result 65. The call conf2d in PyTorch specifies all the characteristics of that product. For example, we used a grayscale image with only one color channel, and we have to specify that in the call with in channels. Also, we only produced one output channel, since we only used one filter, and this is the argument out channel. We also specify the kernel size, which is here 3, and we can further define a stride. In our example, we have just moved the kernel one to the right, but we could also have skipped one alignment position. Then the stride would have been two. With padding, we can control the situations where the kernel would technically overlap with the border of the input image. Also, we have a dilation argument, which is more or less stride for the filter. At the very end, you see a Boolean flag called again bias, where we can control whether we want to use a bias vector or not. Convolutions have another nice property, which is called translation equivariance. On the right side, you see a scheme with an NVIDIA logo on top, where we have applied a convolution to that logo, which is more or less an edge detector. Now you would naively expect, if you translate the input, that you also translate the output. And indeed, that is the case for convolutions. Whenever a map commutes with a translation, you call that map translation equivariant. If you sum over the output, you could even make it translation invariant. On the left side, you see a scientific paper making convolutional network shift invariant again by our friends at Adobe, which show that current state-of-the-art topologies usually ignore a certain sampling property uh, which is needed for translation invariance. They just apply the fix and make their networks more robust against translation and therefore increase the accuracy. Have a look at it. Let's have a look at popular network topologies. On the right side, you see the topology of the famous AlexNet entry of the ImageNet competition in 2012. It consists of two main ingredients, a feature extractor and a classifier. The feature extractor is just a cascade of convolutions that extract certain patterns, and after we have found all the patterns that we are interested in, we pass them to an MLP classifier, which has an output dimension of 1000, since ImageNet has 1000 classes. 
On the left side you see the implementation. Here we just interleave convolutions with nonlinearities and max pooling. After that we define the MLP classifier, which is just a linear layer, followed by a ReLU, a linear layer, a ReLU again. In the forward pass here we just compose the feature extractor with a classifier and that's it. More recent convolutional neural networks use so-called residual shortcuts. Let me briefly explain the math behind that. We start with our function y equals f of x and now we can apply a multivariate Taylor expansion around the point x equals 0. And the zero degree approximation of x is just the point x itself translated by zero. Then the first order approximation is just the Jacobian of the function f at the point x equals zero multiplied with x. There are also higher terms in the order of x squared that we just neglect for the time being. When we simplify this expression, we get x plus the Jacobian of f times x. And we can further write this as identity plus a applied to x. But that means on the right side that we could just convolve the input x with the kernel matrix a, but also bypass x and then finally add the partial results and get our final result y. The name residual network can be explained as follows. Obviously, we can approximate the function f by the identity plus a. But if we rearrange this expression, we get a is f minus the identity. Therefore, the linear map a just approximates here the deviation of f from the identity, the residuum, so to speak. The ResNet topology proposed by Microsoft in 2015 implements here two convolutional blocks, which are interleaved with a nonlinear activation function ReLU, and then we bypass the identity concatenate the results, apply ReLU again, and that's our output. In the following, we can stack this residual block as often as we want. At the bottom of the slide, you see a ResNet34 topology, which almost exclusively consists of residual blocks. Only the very last layer is a fully connected layer with a thousand output neurons, which corresponds to the thousand classes of the ImageNet dataset. There are also bigger ResNet topologies, such as ResNet50. The good news is that you don't have to program ResNet50 on your own. PyTorch comes with a library called Torch Vision, which already has pre-trained models such as ResNet. With Torch Vision, you can just import your ResNet50 topology from the submodule models. Then we instantiate a model object by calling ResNet50. And there's another argument called pre-trained that we set to false since we want to train a model from scratch. But you could also set it to true and then download the pre-trained weights for ImageNet. At the end of this second webinar session, I'd like to introduce the NVIDIA AI Technology Center Toolkit. It is an educational code base. With this two case, we want to showcase the interoperability of the libraries in the CUDA XAI software stack in a multi-GPU environment. Our goal is to provide researchers a reference framework that they can just download to kickstart their own research by adapting it to their needs. The toolkit is open source and will be made available soon. The implementation details of the toolkit will be explained by my colleagues in the following webinar sessions. This is the time for me to say goodbye. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them.